As Nigerians prepare to go to the polls in 44 days, President Muhammad Buhari has renewed his call to foreign governments and their representatives not to meddle in the country's internal affairs. He said this while receiving the new ambassadors of Switzerland, Sweden, Republic of Ireland, the Kingdom of Thailand and the Republic of Senegal, as well as the Republic of South Sudan. At the State House, Adiswa Omoran here reports. The ambassadors arrived at the presidential villa. As it is customary, the Presidential Guards Brigade welcomes the ambassadors of Switzerland, Sweden, Ireland, Thailand, Senegal, and South Sudan. Receiving their credentials to mark their formal commencement of duty, President Muhammad Buhari, for the opt-in time, warns diplomats to stay out of the nation's local politics and to be guided by diplomatic practice ahead of the 2023 elections in Nigeria. I urge you to be guided by diplomatic practice to ensure that your activities remain within the limits of your profession and you monitor the build up to the elections in the conduct of the general election itself. Buhari acknowledges the support of the respective countries in his administration's campaign to deal with the challenges of insecurity and climate change in the Lake Charge region. The president told the ambassadors that Nigeria is working with ECOWAS to tackle the challenges of insecurity and unconstitutional changes in government across West Africa, just as it calls for cooperation and collaboration. Matters of security have become the business of all the nations of the world to work together. Speaking on behalf of the diplomats, the ambassador of Switzerland pledges to exercise their functions with dedication for a mutually beneficial relationship between the countries. We thank you very much for the beautiful, dignified ceremony that your protocol services organized for us. It will remain in our best, unforgettable memories. We're all keenly aware of the importance of Nigeria to the well-being of the entire African continent, its role in international politics and its weight in the world economy. Each and every one of us is proud to, be, to represent his or her country and its interests in this great federal republic of Nigeria. This is the second time in five months that the president will be asking diplomats to stay within the limits of their schedules while urging them to build on the successes of their respective predecessors. In August 2022, while presenting letters of credence to the ambassadors of Canada and Mexico, Buhari urged foreign envoys to be guided by diplomatic practice to ensure that their activities remain within the limits of their profession in the build-up to Nigeria's 2023 general elections. Adesua Omoruan, Arise News. Well, Rufai, a number of things to speak about with regards to the president's meeting with the foreign envoys. I mean, very spot on with the foreign envoys. They got their letter of credence, uh, that of Switzerland, uh, Thailand, and um, Senegal, and a couple of other countries out there. I think the Sudan I saw. Yeah, South well, Sudan. Yeah, South Sudan. I mean, but it, it speaks to the state of things and non-interference. And I was quite, you know, excited when I saw South Sudan there as a country, you know, because, yeah, they got their independence a couple of years ago. It's not been an easy path for them, but this was a country that we saw how they struggled for their independence. But it's, it's well on point, President Buhari saying this, because we've had an historical antecedence of foreign interest meddling elections. I can go way back the 60s. You know, you can talk about foreign interest. I think a name that comes prominently to mind is the likes of the, in, the impute of the likes of Jack Foucault you know, and electioneering across, you know, African states and all of that. Even as recent as the elections in Congo, that was discovered that one of uh, French uh, prominent businessmen, you know, owner of the Viviendi Group, you know, did defend the elections, gave some, you know, advertising, consent and things like that, you know, to be able to help a certain candidate. And we've had that too, one too many times. If you go on the international scene, you remember even Trump's election, the interference of Russian meddling, yeah. you know, how they meddled into that election and all of that. So elections everywhere in the world has some level of foreign interest. And it's good and well upon the president say, we don't want that because we're a sovereign independent nation. 
Because what happens is that when you meddle and you take a side, then it leaves everything out for chaos. And we should be very careful. And if you, if you dial back home, you remember the case of, um, you know, anyway, it was a democratic process, political process, elections were botched, but the American uh, ambassador then, Walter Carrington, did, you know, lead the pro-democracy struggle in Nigeria and all of that. Some people have argued that was some form of meddling and all of that, but the truth has to be said. It is time for us to tell foreign interest to sh shut it out, out of our electoral system. And it has to be said, because once, like I said before, you have foreign interest, it does three things. Number one, it invalidates the results. If you watch closely, one of the major points raised in the last Kenya elections was the fact that they got in some Venezuelans to come and manipulate the electronic system of voting. And that was a big allegation. And, you know, it started a diplomatic breakback between two nations. We should be careful. Another thing it does is it, it divides the country. Once you have foreign elements come in to an election and you see it's open, they're taking sides. And that's why I was happy when Katrina Long said the other day that they're not meddling. The, the British uh, ambassador says, High Commissioner, they're not meddling into Nigeria elections. That was a good reassuring one. It divides the country. As we can see in the case of uh, the last, uh, I think, two couple of elections in Abidjan, where you had Gbagbo and Alisan Ouattara. Abidjan used to be a very peaceful country for so many years. In fact, it was the bastion of peace. It was the only African country and, and the West African subregion that never had a civil war and all of that. There's been, Abidjan was known to be, you know, the bastion of stability. But guess what? Once foreign counterparts took sides with a certain candidate, Gbagbo felt oppressed, and it was a free-for-all. And that country went through the turmoil of a civil war in the, in the 2010s and thereabouts before they finally come out of it and they are rebuilding now. So I'm happy Buhari has said this. It is also for them to heed, and it is also for these countries to be able to heed and not meddle in our elections. Let people go out there, vote free and fair. Yes. And I'm also excited that we are making some headway as regards, you know, PVC collections. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that in the next story. Yes, yes, we will talk about that. Very important, uh, especially because we've been talking about it almost every day here, as we ought to. But I'm uh, um, just speaking to and congratulations to the um, new ambassadors mm. from the countries you mentioned, Switzerland, Sweden, South Sudan, Senegal, Thailand, um, who went to meet with the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria yesterday. The biggest, largest black nation on, on the African continent yes, and also us. the big brother of Africa. Mm. I, I had to say this to help us to understand the reason why there is certainly an interest in this nation, especially uh, um, elections. And the president reiterating his call, the last time he'd met with foreign missions in April of um, 2022, he had made this call in previous election cycles. He had done in 2019, he made the same call that foreign missions or, foreign or other nations should stay clear from the electoral process. Now, if I really look at the functions of a foreign mission, it includes representing their host na their um, um, nation and in their host nation. We talk about talk about issuing passports, visas, representing the interests of members of their nation mm. in their host country, um, monitoring you know economic and security situations are reporting back to their host nation. That's generally what their functions are. None of which says, um, you know, taking part in electioneering Election or interfering in whatever, in, in whatever way. Now, how do foreign missions interfere? Chief of this is in disinformation. Mm. So one of the things that they can do, particularly when they have an interest in it, sometimes it's overt where they go with a particular candidate. And sometimes it is just to undermine the electoral institution of the nation. Remember the foreign, I mean... Um, coming from colonialism, from then they still want to have a hold mm. on nations, particularly in Africa, not to talk about prosperous nations like Nigeria. So how does this play out? They sometimes, um, it could be done by um, prompting or supporting protest demonstrations. It could be done by, so, and, and what they often say is that they use local actors. So mm. in recent times, they work with local actors, so they're not the ones who are at the forefront of doing this. Then they also magnify certain political messages mm. and in reporting. And this is why we must own our media in Nigeria, because when our stories are told by foreign media, they magnify certain things oh, yes. that shouldn't be magnified. So, for instance, the, you know, there are reports online, maybe it's a political figure says something, and they are pushing that agenda. 
these are ways that nations in the past have meddled in political systems. So it's not until they go and manipulate the system, which is, which is what they do as well. But even in the level of information that's out there, Facebook had a report recently whereby they noticed from the United States um, um, elections that there were some sponsored posts and trolls to magnify certain messages online. Hence the warning, because the war now is beyond being physical. There's a media war, war. Yes. and you would see it, it's subtle in some ways, and in some, time, in some forms, it is overt. So for us as Nigerians, we must also watch out for these targeted messages to, to um, fuel the agenda of a particular nation or a particular interest. This is our election. We must protect the sanctity of our democracy and, 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 and our sovereignty as a nation. And so thank you very much to the president for reiterating this call. And we hope, like you said, Rufai, that the nations will heed to this call. Mm. Moving on to the next story. Electoral body INEC has extended the deadline for the collection of permanent voters' cards, or PVCs, by eight days. Collection of cards will now continue until Saturday, 29th January. Collection at the ward level has been extended by one week from Monday, 16th January to Sunday, 22nd January. The commission says it is encouraged by the turnout of registered voters and the surge in the number of collected PVCs across the country. It says in some states, as many as 100,000 PVCs were collected in the last five days since the devolution to ward level started last week. Meanwhile, INEC <coughs> says it's investigating allegations of extortion by its officials at some collection centers around the country. The commission says those found culpable will face disciplinary action on prosecution or prosecution. The Labour Party's Presidential Campaign Council has also accused INEC staff of deliberately slowing down the pace of PVC distributions to Nigerians. And some Nigerians around the country have criticized what they call the long and difficult process in getting their cards. I'm glad we're going to be speaking about this, uh, Rufai, this morning mm. and that INEC has extended collection I, I mean, PVCs. I Kudos to INEC, but the truth is they had no choice. Because when you look at it, you cannot disenfranchise millions of people. I'm sure if they had not extended, a lot of people would have at some point next we probably gone to court and seek legal redress. Because between June and July, we had over 9 million people registered, 13 million people added to the register in this first process, although some people have been put out because of multiple registration and all of that. But give or take, you still have a fair amount of people out there, and these people want to vote. And these people are excited by their candidates, so they have a right to be able to vote. And the only best thing to do was to be able to extend it, but people should also watch the extension. The extension was 16 to 22nd, still going to be at the ward level. So the question is, how easy is this for you to collect at the ward level? <clears throat> I understand that there's a certain portal for INEC in Lagos alone, uh, and I don't know for other parts. I think on their Instagram page, on their social media page, where you can scan a QR code and they'll yeah. tell you exact what. Yes. All right? So if you do that, you scan your QR, they'll tell you exact what. You go there and you get in queue, get there on time to be able to pick it up. Whatever you do, you must be able to pick it up. But that's for the word level. But the extension now goes back to the local government. I think from the 22nd to the 29th, you go back to the local government. So this is ample time, one week on top of this, for you to be able to go out there and pick up your PVC. And also... INEC needs to look inward. There have been cases and allegations. In fact, the face of one prominent extortionist, INEC staff, was put out there on social media. We've had cases of people say, okay, you want to collect for you and your wife, bring 10,000 naira. And it is so sad we do this in this country. And we did it across board. Even you remember when COVID vaccines came out? Oh, yes. You remember how people were paying to get COVID vaccines? And we bust that story here. So please, INEC... You should also have people within your ranks to be able to evaluate. And if you want to catch thief, it's not by you saying, oh, report them. No. There's something we call mystery shopper in marketing. If I want to test the validity or the sales of my product, I have a mystery shopper going there. So you should also have mystery PVC collectors that can scrutinize the process and be able to apprehend people like that. At least we did it in customs, you remember. When the first, uh, the new customs uh, of uh, man in charge of uh, this custom office here, uh, immigration beg your pardon office here, came in in Ikoyi, he did that and he caught some people and he transferred them. So when we do more of that, we'll be able to get a hang of it. But it's a good one. Nigerians, now you have the chance because this is a brilliant chance to change your country. Like I said this morning, a couple of tweets I, I put out there. 
I said, fellow countrymen, this is the best time we have to be able to bring back glory days. Some people have argued that do we ever have glory days? I say yes. To be able to bring back glory days that he told the Palma worm and the canker worms have been destroying our fruits of glory. And it's only elections. And please don't let anybody deceive you. These elections will count. If elections are not count, going to count, you will see politicians will not care about your votes. But they care about your vote. They are buying PVCs. They are stockpiling and manipulating because they know elections count. And the greatest weapon in the hands of every politician is you not turning out on election day to vote. So it's not just collecting your PVCs. You must vote. Yes. A certain candidate for House of Rep told me that you had in Etiosa, the, the constituents, he had over 300,000 voters and less than 50,000 people voted. You don't have a right to complain. If over 300,000 people sat down at home, the elite class that keeps on saying you want to change Nigeria, this is not the time to take a vacation and travel to the UK and go and sit down it's and say, oh, vacation. I fear violence in the Nigeria electoral process. You are worse than people that are doing evil in the country. If you do that, abandon your country during elections and say, I fear violence. Let me just go and sit down in the UK. And it's so easy for you because you have properties in the UK. This is your own country. Please sit down. If all of us can vote, we can truly change our country and we can vote wisely, scrutinize the candidates. Brilliant, absolutely. Now, uh, like you said, let me start from where you stopped in terms of people who deliberately move out of the country or mm. uh, just move themselves from the electoral process because of fear of violence. The truth is that, like you said, the only one of the very effective ways of ensuring that we tackle these things collectively is through our votes and by voting. You, you have a civic responsibility to vote yeah. as a Nigerian citizen. Now, just a few um, things around information. You can actually check your status as to whether you're on the registration, um, on, 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 the re on the register, by going to, to cvr.inecnigeria.org. You can check your status very quickly. And then, like Rufai said, as well, to add to that, there's, there are numbers you can actually send your name, your um, local government area, and they'll send you, and your word, and they'll send you where you should go and pick up. So I, I tested it, and it worked. By text message, they'll charge you your normal text rate, and then they'll send back to you where you should collect. I found my primary school where I'm supposed to um, collect, so that's on the side. Have you collected? Well, I, I, because I'm going to collect on Monday. On Monday, okay, yes. good. So I'm very grateful that I'm still going to be able to collect at the world level. Mm -hmm. I already prepped myself to go to my local government area, but definitely, we're all in this. And it's become such a um, it's become such a big thing that people put up on social media like a cele celebration. Mm -hmm. Once you pick up your PVC, you go online and you take a picture with it because it's an achievement. And like we said um, before, that beyond collecting your PVCs, ensure that you actually go out on election day. Now, away from that, INEC is um, doing their sensitization um, um, campaign. I also want to call on religious organizations and um, private organizations and other organizations to work hand in hand to enable and encourage their members to go out there and get their PVCs. It's not enough for the government or INEC alone to raise this, you know, to mobilize people to collect. I recall, uh, Rufai, that when they were registering, when there was a registration process going on, churches, mosques were preaching about this in their congregation and asking people without being partisan, without telling them who to vote for, just to um, be aware of their civic responsibility. I believe that there's a multi-stakeholder approach that can be done to encourage, because the numbers are abysmal. The numbers of people who are going to collect their PVCs compared to those who registered are disappointed. Yes. We cannot complain later on if we're not encouraging our members. So there was also a time when organizations were giving day off, days off to their staff members to go out and register. In the same vein, can we appeal to you to give your staff time that is concentrated to, that is um, just particularly encouraging them to go out and get their PVCs? Because many people will say because they close work late, the offices are open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. This is within working hours. Yes, they're open on Saturday and Sunday, but why don't you contribute to to the growth of this nation by encouraging your staff members to go out there and pick their PVCs, run competitions. The, 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 the stake, this, our nation is at stake. We are trying to 
redeem a nation here. And so whatever it takes, we all must take on that responsibility to do so. Preach it in your churches. Build, you know, take on billboards. Put on there and encourage. Let us see it everywhere. Have you gotten your PVC? Do you have your PVCs? And then closer to election time, mobilize your members as well to go out there and vote. You don't have to be partisan. Don't tell them who to vote for. Just ensure that every Nigerian participates in the electoral process. And I, and I think, you know, we'll continue to monitor this in the few days to come um, mm. in terms of how people are picking up. But let me just mention the top states in terms of picking up are Cross River State, Plateau, and Enugu State. Mm. Lagos, obviously, is not anywhere close. And we must see Lagos. And it's cannot, sad. It's really Seven sad. million voters, but they don't come out to vote. It will be a miracle if you get three million people that vote out of, of the seven million registered. Operation, number. three million PVCs collected, or five million. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah, Absolutely. we can do it. Yeah. So the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission will remove the former Director General of the Labour Party Presidential Campaign Council, Dwayne Okupe, from its watch list following his arrest in Lagos. Okupe was arrested and then released by the Department of State Services at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport. He has reportedly been on the ESCC's watch list for six years. The DSS cited his cooperation with the ESCC as the reason for Okupe's arrest. In December, Okupe was sentenced to two and a half years in prison for breaching the money Money Laundering Act. Hmm. All right, so I hear apologies have been made. But yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but apologies are not good enough because when the news spreads, the apology doesn't spread as fast. So it's also incumbent on the right authorities to make the apologies public, not just as somebody making the apologies in silos. What was the issue? Uh, Mr. Daniel Kukwe was going abroad for his medical checkup. He was stopped by the DSS. The DSS issued an alert. The story went viral that it was intercepted. They handed over him over to EFCC. They said, oh, we're sorry that you've been on the watch list for over six years for something that has been largely cleared, and the watch list was not updated. Since and that December 19th. Yeah, on the road and road that road. led to this embarrassment. So now they're just saying they'll update the watch list. What structural incompetence is that? What structural incompetence is that? And you do that at the expense of people. You damage their names because you can't update your systems. And you're the quickest to share this story. And that's why I said the apology didn't go far enough because the apology was just made in Zylo. Was even an apology made in the first place? Was it a public apology? Because the tweet by Donny Okukwe just said it was just somebody within, I think one of the officers that yeah. said we apologize. No, there has to be an institutional apology. Let's learn to do things right. If the man has been cleared off the watch list, why don't you put him off the watch list? And how many more people have their cases been decided and are still on the watch list? Because when this floats around, there's an embarrassment. And you can't take back the effect on the personality of the person. There are a lot of people that have been put on watch list, they've been taken off, and arrests were made, again, based on the fact that they were on the watch list, and it's tainted their character and their image. So things should be done properly. Apart from the cocoon apology, it should be made to be done properly. And all of this is also a big deal because it's politics season. But here we will get to the nitty gritty. What are the facts of the matter? These are the facts of the matter we have said. The fact of the matter, I was arrested by the DSS, taken to EFCC, EFCC said we are sorry, we did not know that this has been cleared. We should take you off the watch list. That's the fact of the matter. Because we've seen a lot of political spin to it. And that's why we say, see, rather than political spin this season, let us dwell on the issues. It's a time of a lot of political spin. That's the way politics work anyway. But can we have a new set of thinking of politics where we can talk about things that will, that, that will grow our nation? Because we fail to realize that 2023 election is a fight for the soul of Nigeria. If Nigeria will continue its abyss of hopelessness, your vote will determine that. And if it will be redeemed with renewal of hope, your vote will determine that. And if it will be a better day for our country, it is you that will determine that. No other person will fix your country for you. So let's focus on the main important issues this campaign season. So I think we've cleared that. Yes, we've cleared that. Thank you. I mean, not a lot to add to that. Just to mention that he was convicted in this, on December 19. He was, um, he was um, ordered to serve a custodial sentence of two and a half years or 
in lieu of that a fine which he has paid. And this happened because they said they did not update the watch list. <laughs> We've spoken to this. And you um, align the character of a person, discredit <clears throat> his person. Uh, in reports, it was said the former, immediate former DG um, of the campaign of the Labour Party. You know, so th there are wide, far reaching implications. Oh, yes. It's not just on the person of Mr. Dunyo Kupe, it's also, number one, his track record, his integrity, and of course, the integrity of the party that he belongs to. Yeah. In, in the, in, in, with the, at the risk of politicizing this, we must politicize it because this is a election season. And, and and like I said earlier on about disinformation, we also found in reports that disinformation is not just from um, foreign actors. The main culprits, according to that report I mentioned from Facebook, based on the analysis, are from our local mm -hmm. actors, people who sponsor false news, who ensure that news like this make the headlines across different platforms. But apologies like this are made in private. I hope that the EFCC who ordered, who had put him on the watch list and who have now come to say it was erroneous would apologize to him publicly. I, I doubt it very much, but I'm hoping that they would take out one or two um, headlines themselves to let the public know because this is a public figure, he's a public personality and he has his, um, he has his reputation at stake. Naturally or ideally he would sue for, um, you know, for, for libel. He will sue for defamation of character. But I, I doubt very much if you if go out, go ahead with that, just so that they settle things amicably. But again, you pointed out something really important in terms of how many more Nigerians who do not have a name or status, who have been wrongfully accused, wrongfully arrested, and just, you know, detained, and then asked, oh, sorry, we made an error. Too many stories that shouldn't happen. Trust yes, me. Yes, you don't, clean up their books. You, you don't want to go to Nigerian prisons. Goodness me. Well, that's all on the news headlines.